Okay, so our next speaker, we're a little ahead of time, so we have more time. No. <laughs> so our next speaker is Dr. Nancy Maisel. She's, uh, she received her PhD from Harvard University. She was professor in the departments of molecular biophysics and biochemistry and genetics at Yale University School of Medicine before joining the University of Washington in Seattle in the fall of 2000, where she currently has been since then. She's now professor of immunology and biochemistry, adjunct professor of pathology, and director of molecular medicine program. Uh, Dr. Maisel will um, present some very innovative data on pathways of homologous directed repair of a DNA NICs um, using single strand oligo donors, and, and will discuss, I think, the implications for genome editing. So, Dr. Um, Maisel's talk is uh, gene correction at targeted. DNA mix. Thank you for the nice introduction and the nice invitation to be here. I hope what I'm going to tell you about is not just interesting, but will be useful to at least some of you in its clinical application. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so what I want to tell you about today is really mechanistic work. I have no disclosures. And um, we're focusing on mechanism because if you know the mechanism, you're able to change it and optimize it in ways that will be generally useful to all cells. So this is like if I could look under the hood of the car and figure anything out, we're looking under the hood of the processes that you're using in the hopes of making them better. So for the first part of the talk will be about the mechanism of homology-directed repair at NICS. And then I'll go on to tell you some very recent results on gene correction by interallelic recombination targeted by Cas9 um, and Cas9D10 NICase. So why NICs? We hypothesized that NICs would induce fewer mistakes, fewer potential translocations and mutations and strange little indels than double-strand breaks. And this seemed intuit intuitively obvious, not just to us, but to people we talked with. What people seemed to object to when we began this work was the idea that NICs could stimulate homologous recombination at all. The attitude was, it's a NIC, just re-ligate it. Cells hadn't heard that, but people seemed to think that's what was going on. So uh, we got a lot of flack about this project because uh, there was a general reaction that even though NICs might be a really good idea in principle, it wasn't going to actually give you recombination. And um, I knew something kind of secret, that there were some physiological precedents, this wasn't secret, it was in the literature and available to most people, of NICs initiating homology-directed repair. And the famous one of the two immunologists was that in all birds, there is relatively little VDJ recombination to make immunoglobulin gene diversity, and most of it derives from NICs initiated by um, activation-induced deaminase that causes local patchwork gene conversion at the immunoglobulin loci. And so this is over on the right of the slide. Um, pathogens all have ways of evading the immune system, and these typically depend on some kind of NICs. And the most famous of all is one in um, Neisseria gonorrhea, which was discovered in Hank Seifert's lab just down the road at Northwestern University. But there are other examples in trypanosomes and other microorganisms. So knowing this evolutionary background, which is playing into all of our work, uh, we thought that NICs would probably be a very profitable starting place. So indeed, we showed that NICs could initiate homology-directed repair. And I'm going to call it HDR, not gene correction, because sometimes we're wrecking genes when we do our experiments. Um, and there was little accompanying mutagenic end joining, uh, indels, mutations, deletions, short or long deletions. And the ratio was about 100, 300, 400, 500 to 1 sometimes. And other labs, many other labs have recapitulated this. So we know that NICs are potentially a scarless way to do genome editing as long as we apply them correctly. So one of the first questions that comes to mind is, are homology-directed repair pathways different at NICs and at double-strand breaks? So there was a feeling that a NIC since can be converted to a double-strand break at replication if the replication fork proceeds to the end of the NIC, as diagrammed on the right of the slide, everybody can see that. 
and that that is the double-stranded end that is invading the donor DNA and carrying out recombination. And we actually had an editor of a journal tell us that we had to show there was no double-strand break in the cells. Well, this is a really uh, suicide mission because there's no way to convince something that somebody's, something's not there that they expect to be there. So instead, we decided to show that NICS used different, mechanistically different pathways of recombination than double-strand breaks. And at this point, the combination at NICS was a black box illustrated by question marks on the slide. But double-strand breaks were well known to undergo resection so that single-stranded three prime ends were revealed. And RAD51 would bind those ends loaded by BRCA2 and proteins in those families. And one of the ends would invade a homologous region of the double-stranded donor copy sequence from it and use that sequence for recombination. So the double strand break repair pathway was extremely well defined. Nothing was known about NIC repair and everybody was hoping NICs would feed into the double strand break repair pathway partly so they wouldn't have to learn anything new. It turned out to be very different from that. The difference between a NIC and a double strand break is if something, if there's a NIC, it's on a single strand and you can ask if there's strand asymmetry, if it matters on which strand you've made the nick. And the first thing that we were able to show is that if we nicked an actively transcribed strand, that HDR was much higher than if a nick was on the non-transcribed strand, as shown in the graph on the right. And we were also able to show, by using an inducible TET promoter, that at nicks, if the DNA was transcribed, the um, recombination occurred at a higher frequency, but at double strand breaks, transcription didn't affect frequency as shown on the right. So clearly something different is going on and there's strand asymmetry that characterizes it. There's further strand asymmetry that we were able to identify in that there are different pathways of repair if you provide a NIC DNA with a single-stranded oligonucleotide donor that's complementary to either the nic or the intact strand. So as you can see, um, if you make a NIC on one strand, you have two possibilities for repair donors. The donor could be complementary to the intact strand, yeah, or it'll have a completely different sequence if it's complementary to the nic strand. And we were able to um, predict and then validate the models shown here, where in the CN pathway, with a donor complementary to the NIC strand, the donor anneals to an exposed three prime flap created probably by helicase unwinding at the NIC. And then the three prime end of that flap primes new DNA synthesis, just like a primer in a PCR reaction. So it's a reaction essentially everybody in this room has read about and most of you have probably done. And then that new DNA sequence is incorporated from the donor into the target. In contrast, donors complementary to the intact strand seem to hybridize to the intact strand, which is revealed by unwinding or nuclease activity at both the five prime and three prime sides of the NIC. And then the ends are chopped off or processed in some way and incorporated into the DNA either by mismatch repair or by physical incorporation. So these are quite different pathways. Um, and um, we set about to ask what's going on with these pathways. So the first thing we thought is, do you need RAD51, um, which is the sine qua known for canonical double strand break repair. And we tested that by asking if inhibition of RAD51 activity or loading affected HDR at NICS. And this is where we got the kind of surprise that was, uh, makes you say, are you sure you didn't make up the tubes to the person who did it? And this is work carried out by Luther Davis in my lab who essentially never mixes anything up. And um, Luther found that if you inhibit RAD51, at double strand breaks, the frequency of HDR plummets as seen, whoops, over here on the, I don't want to blind you, I'm sorry, as seen over here on the left. Whereas um, at 
the right, we show that the frequency of HDR at NICs um, increases greatly when RAD51 is inhibited. And we showed that's not just true for RAD51 itself, but for the factors that load RAD51 or it, upon expression of dominant negative versions of RAD51 or of um, inhib inhibitors of RAD51, peptide inhibitors. So clearly RAD51 is not inquired at NICs. We believe that the mechanism reflects the fact that double-strand breaks have their ends resected, and um, so there's no possibility of them to re -anneal. so RAD51 can bind and promote DNA invasion. Whereas at NICs, there's no resection, but binding of RAD51 instead causes the DNA to re so that it is unable to hybridize to the oligo since the mother DNA molecule, the parent molecule, prefers to stay intact itself. Okay, so if there are these distinct pathways and RAD51 is not involved in recombination, this has some very practical implications for target do donor design, and these are implications people weren't aware of until we understood this mechanism. Um, often people would say, let's put a nick here and just plaster an oligo over it for repair, and it didn't work because they were pointing the five prime and three prime ends in the wrong direction, for example. Um, and here, the mechanism-based guidelines strongly predict that HDR at a NIC templated by an oligo donor will only insert sequence in the five prime end of the donor or the, towards the three prime end of the new DNA synthesis by the NIC if the NIC is being repaired by the CN pathway, right? because the three prime end of the NIC primes new DNA synthesis. So you can only get things beyond that three prime end. Whereas at the CI pathway, the donor is predicted to be able to span the target site and um, transfer of sequence will be bi-directional. And there are also predictions about requirements for homology between the three prime end of the NIC and the donor. Just like in a PCR reaction, if a three prime end is heterologous, if it mismatches the donor, you won't get good PCR. The same is true at a NIC. There's relatively little excision, and if there's base mismatch, the repair pathway doesn't work very well. So I'll show you the unidirectional aspect of this repair because it's very important in designing oligos to repair NIC targets. Um, here we see first that heterology at the ends limits the um, HDR at NICs. And here we sh show that the CN donor transfers unidirectionally while the CI donor transfers bidirectionally. And you can see that a Hindi 3 site is transferred for um, both the CI and CN donors, but an APO1 site only for the CI donor. There's no cleavage by APO1 after repair and that's because the APO1 side is behind the part that's um, transferred. And this also turns out to be true for double strand breaks. They seem to be using a pathway like the CN pathway, wherein the donor hybridizes to the target and there's unidirectional transfer of information. So this is important if you're using olig single-stranded oligos to repair double strand breaks too. And the advantages of single-strand oligos for repair, of course, are that they don't integrate in the genome, they're cheap, they're clean, they're easy to synthesize, and you can multiplex trying a whole bunch of different oligos and different repair reactions. So I'd like to go on now and talk about some extremely recent results in the lab where we are looking at gene correction by what you can think of as biallelic or interallelic recombination. And that's a kind of correction that has extraordinarily rich potential for treatment of human disease. So I just want to start by getting some terminology straight because the literature is very confusing on this point. We're all, we all know people are diploid. We get a chromosome from mom and one from dad. If there's crossover or reciprocal recombination, you can move a big or little piece of a chromosome so that each chromosome that has the same genes, just part of them are from a different parent. There's also a process called loss of heterozygosity also known as gene conversion or copy neutral loss of heterozygosity or by hardcore human geneticists as uniparental disomy. And in this process, there is non-Mendelian exchange of markers so that a region of DNA in dad's chromosome matches that region from mom's. So there's no heterozygosity, 
there's um, twice as many of mom's markers without increase in gene dosage. Everybody gets this? Okay, so if there's a SNP, there'd be SNPs from mom on dad's chromosome and dad would lose his SNPs in that region. Sometimes the literature refers to loss of heterozygosity when they really mean to say simply deletion. You do lose heterozygosity if there's deletion in a region of the chromosome, but it's much simpler to describe it as deletion because the copy number has been reduced. And now people are much stricter, but the literature has not been corrected, so you can be very confused if you go back and try and read papers in this field. So now that we're on the same playing field, as far as terminology goes, I want to go on and tell you what we did. In principle, and it hadn't been proven, um, and those of you with biotech connections know that there's a huge difference between in principle and in practice, um, interallelic recombination correct two kinds of very important mutations. Dominant negative mutations by using one parent's good copy to correct the other parent's bad copy, and also compound heterozygous mutations where one gene has to, um, one exon that's bad in one parent and another exon that's bad in another parent, and you'd like to just put all the bad exons on one chromosome and make one good gene copy. So that, that compound heterozygous mutations are essentially being corrected by reciprocal recombination, right? You move both bad copies to the same place, but you don't lose either of them. A dominant negative mutation would need to be corrected by loss of heterozygosity or gene conversion. You want to completely get rid of the bad copy or region. Everybody's with me? Okay. So we wanted to make a model system that would enable us to study the mechanism of interallelic recombination because we had found that models could be very, very powerful in doing screens for ways to increase or decrease frequencies of processes. And there was no good physiological model that we were aware of that we could just play with in the lab. And so what we decided to do was to use the CD44 locus in the human genome as our essentially a reporter gene, even though it's a chromosomal gene. CD44 is composed of 18 exons, and it spans about 94 kilobases on chromosome 11 P13. If there are mutations in either exon 1 at one end or exon 17 at the other end, then CD4 is not expressed on the cell surface where it's normally expressed in almost all cells. Exon 1 mutations inhibit initiation of translation, and exon 17 mutations are in the membrane spanning domain that enables this glycoprotein to be retained on the cell surface. So we knew that we could make mutations at one end and the other of the gene, which would give us a lot of space in between for interallelic recombination to be targeted by CRISPR-Cas. CD44 is expressed on most cells. It's a large 742 amino acid glycoprotein. It is involved in cell migration and cell communication. It's implicated in metastasis, but it is not essential in cell culture. So culture cells are fine without it. And it's an important T cell development marker, so there are insanely good commercial antibodies that enable you to easily detect CD44 on the surface of cells and distinguish CD44 positive and minus cells, which was really important as a starting point. So what we did, and this is the work of Kevin Koo, who is a wonderfully talented undergraduate in my lab. He's now a medical student at the University of Washington. Um, we made a derivative of, of the HT1080 human fibrosarcoma line, which is largely diploid in culture, because that seemed like the right starting point for this contract, with a mutation in CD4 exon 1 on one chromosome and a mutation in CD4 44 exon 17 on the other chromosome. And this took a lot of about six or eight months of um, fidgeting, but we now know how to do it and can do it much more quickly. And the resulting cells were CD44 negative because they had biallelic mutations, com hetero compound heterozygous mutations in the CD44 gene. And our goal was to convert them to CD44 positive and uh, di displaying cell surface CD44 by targeting recombination between exons 1 and exons 17. And there was about 90 KB that we could work with there, including a very large um, intron right next to CD44. So 
We did this, and remarkably, we showed that we could target either NICs or breaks between exons, mutant exon 1 and exon 17, and we could get interallelic recombination. With double strand breaks, the frequency was about 0.4%. This is our first experiment, but that is the frequency we still find. At NICs, it was about tenfold lower, 0.04% which is low but reproducible, and it's a number you could certainly bootstrap up from. And if there was no cleavage, there were about 0.004% of cells that seemed green, and as those of you who do a lot of, lot of flow know, there's always a little bit of background, and those cells don't seem to live on culture, and they don't have a combination. So we think it is truly some kind of flow background. Um, in principle, and once again, this is only in principle, the CD44 positive cells could have been generated either by LOH or by crossover, reciprocal recombination. And we were hoping we'd see both, but we really had no idea what we'd see. We thought, if anything, we would not see any LOH. And in order to distinguish these two outcomes, what you have to do is grow up individual recombinants. You sort out the green cells, and then sequence or characterize restriction fragment polymorphisms to see if there's LOH or crossover. And so Kevin did that, and this is obviously real work, a lot of attention. And you can see here's a difference in the sequence trace, and this is Kevin's first sequence trace showing that he got at least one homozygosity at the CD44 exon 1 um, region and you can see the heterozygous parent and the homozygous uh, descendant on the left. And then we streamlined the assay by looking for loss of a characteristic TTH1 site, and you can see that on the right. Um, curiously, the first two of the 400 clones Kevin had sequenced both had LOH, but he had to get up to number 48 before I saw another example. Um, and at NICS, it turns out, you'll see the data on this next slide, that LOH accounts for about 40% of the intraallelic recombinants that um, we get at NICS. So it's a minority, but quite a significant minority. And the rest are um, reciprocal recombinants. At double strand breaks, most of the recombinants are reciprocal recombinants generated by crossover recombination, but there still is this small fraction of NICS. We've looked at just a few of the junction sequences in our sort of preview result, but we don't have it tabulated or haven't done statistics on it. It appears that recombination is scarless at NICS. There are no indels, there's no trace that anything happened. But at double strand breaks, we're seeing indels just like people very frequently see after they've done engineering with double strand breaks. So that's where we are with this. Um, I'm excited to be here because this approach, interallelic recombination targeted by CRISPR-Cas, is a method that should be applicable to correct dominant negative mutations, as well as compound heterozygous mutation in a number of different human genes. The frequencies are low, but I think clever means of identifying cells can enable us to work around the low frequencies, and it especially enables us to utilize the really lovely feature of NICS, that when you do engineering with NICS, it leaves no trace, no footprint in the genome, and um, it diminishes concerns about off-target cleavage and uh, makes one more confident of the final results. So you guys, you, this is your hematopoietic cell biologist, some of you, and you know there are lots of candidate mutations that could be dealt with. Um, the thalassemias caused by unstable hemoglobin beta chains are one that I was familiar with even before um, starting on this work. And then, of course, there are osteogenesis imperfecta, which is a Col A1 mutation caused by dominant negative mutations in the Col A1 peptide. It makes collagens a triple helix, so if you have one bad peptide um, in the triple helix bundle, it makes, um, it causes a phenotype. And I learned yesterday about a disease called epidermal lysis bullosa due to collagen 7 mutations that can also be caused by dominant negative mutations. I'm sure there's a much, much longer list, and we're really eager for this um, technology to be applied in practical contexts.
And so um, if you have good ideas, I'd love to talk to you, or I know this meeting is huge, please email me, mazels at uw.edu, and I'd be glad to continue the conversation in those contexts. So I'd like to conclude by saying I've talked about two pathways that support HDR at NICS by single-stranded donors. And if you know the mechanisms, you can greatly increase the efficiency of recombination. And the targeted NICS and double-strand breaks can be very useful in close-up uh, correction of um, genes. And I hope I've persuaded you that NICS may be simple, but they're very powerful tools for gene therapy. And finally, I'd like to thank the NIH and NCI that supported my work. This is a drone picture of my lab, and uh, Luther and Kevin are there, along with other people who contributed in different ways to the work. So thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. OK, so we're open for questions. I'll just get started. Is there, um, so my understanding is that a lot of this data, if not all of this data, was generated with cell lines. Yes. Uh, any, any data at all using primary cells, and obviously the cell of interest in here, the uh, hematopoietic stem progenitor cell? No, but we would love to have help generating that. Our, our, our major skill is not in culturing hematopoietic cells. So Open we're happy to help anybody who would like to try. Okay. Fantastic talk. Can you tell me if you worry about interallelic recombination that would cause uh, um, bi centromeric or a centromeric uh, chromosomes? So, so there's a directionality that I didn't go into to the interallelic recombination that's dictated by the centromere, and so one has to figure out how one wants to do this before starting. And I have slides on that, but it didn't. It's pretty nitty gritty, but I'm happy to talk about. Hi, that was really interesting. Um, do you did you try with those last few slides to inhibit Rad fifty? Well, inhibit BRCA two or Rad fifty one. Yes, see? and we don't we don't see a requirement for Rad fifty one. So whether you would call this homologous or, combination yeah. or not is. Yeah. Um, but or sorry, other question. Do you try to increase end joining to try and and try to increase? Oh wait. So so we've just started yes. we've just started experiments yeah. asking if we inhibit um, the NHEJ pathway. Yeah. What happens? And we're just getting results in now, so we don't we haven't done that enough times to talk about it yet. Very interesting work. Um, in the case of L, uh, LOH, uh, can you comment on the length of the conversion tract? Could I comment on what? The length of the gene conversion tract. Um, I, we don't know anything about the actual gene conversion pathway yet. We know that the um, transfer of markers extends over probably 20 to 50 KB because we tracked SNPs at 20 and 40 and 50. Um, we haven't done long scale sequencing to try to figure out exactly how far it extends. Um, we've tried inhibiting RAD52, which is kind of the sine qua known for some yeast break-induced repair pathways, and we're not really seeing a reproducible effect of that. Um, the frequencies are relatively low, so um, if you inhibit and get a 50% effect, we tend to think that's something that we should do more thoroughly later. So there could be a small effect, but it's not a whopping effect. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, just one quick one. So in the physiological setting, uh, repair of NICs, um, what would be the source of this oligo that, we, that you tra transfer? Yeah, so the, in, right. so the, the, if we don't need an oligo in these um, interallelic recombination experiments, if you wanted to transfer an oligo in a physiological setting, I think it would be challenging because we have to put in a lot of oligos. They seem to be destroyed when they enter the cell. So, uh, but this is a way for ex vivo genome editing, which seems to be one place we're having a lot more success currently than others. And um, one wonders if one might not have some fancy nanostructure or liposstructure eventually that could transfer this kind of donors. I just don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, is there one more question? Oh, okay. 
So, uh, very I nice talk. Um, is this process dependent on cell division? or is it happening in non-dividing cells? So we haven't looked at non-dividing cells. When we draw it out, we think that we could be getting loss of heterozygosity po in post-S phase cells, and um, we would just have to try that. We think that there must be pathways for repair of NICs in non-dividing cells because our neurons are all non-dividing, and NICs are an inevitable source of DNA damage from oxidation. And so we would expect there to be some pathway for this, but we don't know that we have hooked into it in our experiments. So um, just another, do I have time to ask another? Yeah. Yeah. So um, where do you create the NIC uh, in respective to what? what uh, so that, that's a good question. We actually, I didn't tell you, we've made NICs all over, and it seems to work if we NIC almost anywhere between exon 1 and 17. That's a big region. And we no, don't, no difference in that. We don't see any difference. We see a few sites where we see almost no recombination, and there's a wonderful paper, I think, from Caribou, where they looked at essentially cleavage by, at 42 different sites in the genome and six different cell types, and they found that some sites seemed to be better or worse than others, and it was determined by sequence rather than chromo chromatin structure, um, kind of remarkably. And so we think there may just be some sequences that don't cleave well, and that reduces the frequency rather than distance from one end or the other of the target. And we were a bit surprised by that. We've taken out mostly using a site in intron one um, because we know it works. And you know, if you have eight things you have to do in every experiment, it just adds to the workload without, we didn't think we were learning much from looking at all the targets. And one final uh, comment. Actually, patients with uh, DNA repair defects, especially Fanconia anemia, often revert their mutation. And you know, those could be like natural examples of this process occurring, could you test for that after the fact? So you can test for that after the fact by sequencing, and it would be great if somebody who had those FANC samples <coughs> would do that. You would predict these spontaneous revertants. You'd also predict spontaneous revertants in um, BRCA deficiencies if mm -hmm. there was recombination through NICs. And certainly um, BRCA deficient tumors do slough off cells that have reverted. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we would, love, we would love to see those sequence data. When we've looked, we haven't found it, but I'd love to talk to someone expert in the field to find out if they looked, if they could see something. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Exciting talk.